اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم Now I'm going to stop here for a second and I'll show you how all of this is connected. The grandfather we talked about is who? You know, the, uh, Ibrahim a.s. is unique among all the other prophets. Among all the other prophets, the title, the title of father goes to only two people in, in the Quran. Our father. Of course, our father in humanity is who? Adam a.s. And our father in religion is actually Ibrahim a.s. Every other prophet, we call them our messengers. We call them messengers and prophets. Uh, Anbiya and Rusul. But for Ibrahim a.s. is not just a messenger to us. Millata abikum, Ibrahim. The religion of your father, Ibrahim. One of the names of Islam in the Quran is the religion of your father. I want you to think about that. One of the names of Islam is what? The religion of your father. Who's the father reference to? Ibrahim a.s. So we are the religion of Ibrahim. We're the religion of our father, Ibrahim. How many pillars in Islam? I'm going to show you four out of five. I'm going to skip zakat. I'm going to skip zakat. I know this is IDB, you guys are like, why, why are you skipping zakat? <laughs> That's an important one. <laughs> but I'll show you four out of five. First one, shahada. The idea of la ilaha illallah is clearer, clearer in the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam than any other legacy. Born in a family, born in a village, born in a tribe of idol builders. Idol worshippers. The only one who stands up for what? La ilaha illallah. The only one, and by the way, an ummah by himself. And then the, old, the one who is commissioned to build the house that will make sure that until the day of judgment, what is secure? La ilaha illallah. That house represents the worship of one God at the expense of everything else. Isn't it? So our shahada is actually continuation of the legacy of who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam says, La uhibbul afilin. I don't love, you know, the sun. He talked about the sun and the moon. And he said, I don't love things that settle. You know, the most magnificent creation you can see around you is the sun. There's no bigger creation with your naked eye that you can see than the sun. And so he demonstrated to his people how the sun is not God, yes? And the moon is not God. But he said something interesting about the sun and the moon. He said, I don't love things that disappear or settle, that decline. You could decline is a good word. For Afil. Now, I want you to think about this. Our prayers on a daily basis, don't they revolve around the decline of the sun? The rise and fall of the sun? The fact that the sun is a temporary entity for us. It rises, it has its glory, then it starts setting, and it's weakened. And as it, every major position shift, it's time for a different what? It's a time for a different prayer, isn't it? As a matter of fact, our prayers are a manifestation of Ibrahim alayhi salam's statement, La uhibbul afilin. As a, uh, what's really interesting, according to one great scholar, Hamiduddin Farahi, is Allah designed it it's, as such a legacy of Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, that when the sun is at its weakest position, when, when you can truly start seeing the weakness of the sun is Maghrib. And Isha is just completely gone. And Fajr is just beginning to rise. So those three are when, the, when it's clearest that the sun is weak. And those three are when we pray the loudest. Our, our recitation is actually loud in those three times. And every other time it's what? Silent. It's actually a, it's a manifestation of, as, as a matter of fact, the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And by the way, prayer goes back directly to Ibrahim alayhi salam for many reasons. This is one of them. Like, Rabbi ja'alni muqima. As-salat, it's the prayer of Ibrahim. Make me the one who establishes the prayer. And out of my children. So when, every time we say, قَدْ قَامَتِ salah, Or when the Imam says, أَقِمِ salah, They're actually repeating the dua of who? Ibrahim a.s. So, shahada goes back to him. Prayer goes back to him. I'll go in strange order, because we want to talk about Ramadan. We'll talk about Hajj. Third. Which, which one am I skipping again? I'm skipping zakat. So, three, four out of five at least we'll get to discuss. Hajj. I, I don't think Hajj has anything to do with Ibrahim alayhi salam. Right? I mean, what could it possibly have to do with Hajj is... Oh, wait a second. Where do we do Hajj? Uh, the building he built? There is a little tiny space there called Maqam... What? Oh, yeah. Ibrahim. Oh, I, I don't think Safa and Marwa have anything to do with Ibrahim Oh, yeah, that too. 
Ish. Okay, so how about how about how about Zamzam? That has nothing to do with it. Oh wait, that too. Okay, no, I got I got this. Slaughtering the animal has nothing to do with him. Oh that too. <laughs> The entire celebration of Hajj is actually what? A celebration of the legacy of? Ibrahim alayhi salam. The entire thing. The ultimate accomplishment in the life of a Muslim, the huge burden off his or her shoulders, is the ability to make Hajj. To ab the ability to take the journey that one day, one day, a long, long time ago, his or her father Ibrahim alayhi salam took, isn't it? We're going to date the journey of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's, it's incredible. You know, I was at a gathering of Christian and Jewish communities and they talked about the religion of Abraham, like the Abrahamic faiths, that's what they call them, the Abrahamic faiths. And I started very offensively, I said, I don't think anybody has the right to call themselves part of the Abrahamic faiths with the Muslims. We have a convention every year that celebrates Abraham, what do you guys have? You have millions of people from all over the world that can't even speak to each other, but they love their father Abraham. And look at what they do every year. Millions of people. Just exactly the same. Going through every single, even Jamarat goes back to him. You know? Every single ritual they perform is a celebration of the legacy of who? Abraham. Abraham. You show me what you guys do. Show me how you are the religion of Abraham. I gave this talk and that's what, the day I made friends with the rabbi because he was in the first row and he was crying his face off. He's like, we need to spend time together. I was like, okay, yeah, let's do it. If you know a good kosher restaurant, I'm in. You know, <laughs> it's going to be hard in Texas, but we'll find something. <laughs> but anyway, three so far. Shahada, prayer, obviously Hajj, yes? But the one I came to talk to you about was, uh, how is he going to do that? What does Ramadan have to do with Ibrahim? He didn't fast. <laughs> they didn't have iftar back then. What's he going to talk about? Well, listen, listen, listen. Both Ibrahim and Ismail are together and they pray. They ask for a single what? Messenger. But they don't just ask for a single messenger. They ask for that messenger to do something. He will read your revelations onto them. This messenger's job will be to what? Give you what? Revelation. Give these people revelation. What revelation did the Prophet come with? Okay, so he came with Qur'an. Qur'an came at what time? Shahr Ramadan, alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an, yeah? So Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an came down. Inna anzalnahu fi, help me out here, Laylatul Qadr, yes? We sent it down in the night of power. The night of power is in which month? In the month of Ramadan. Ramadan was the month in which the dua of Ibrahim was answered. The dua of Ibrahim was a messenger who will recite the ayat. He became a messenger in the month of Ramadan. The ayat came to him that he could recite onto people when? In the month of Ramadan. The entire month of Ramadan, we are celebrating that the dua of Ibrahim was finally answered. Alayhi salam. That's what we're doing. What I started with was we talk about Ramadan every year, but we don't much talk about certain things that I think are important. We need to remember what this is about. Was Ibrahim alayhi salam concerned with one group or was he concerned with humanity? He was concerned with humanity, yes? Did he, even if, even the most sinful of people, did he have hatred towards them? I give you an example today. I give you an example that even the most sinful of people, he didn't have hatred towards them. Which example did I give you? The nation of Lut. And we are the religion of our father, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Can you understand that there are people who recite the Qur'an and justify hatred through the Qur'an? Forgetting the fact that this Qur'an is the fulfillment of the dua of who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. Whose entire legacy was love and concern for all of humanity. So they can find that love of Allah like he found. Subhanallah. How far we've come. When you don't understand where you're coming from, you can't understand where you're going. This is the, this is the first and foremost thing I wanted to bring to your attention. That we are part of a universal religion. This religion appeals to all humanity. And we have to understand that this, this, this is why now, if you understand the ayat of Ramadan now from that perspective, and you'll, it'll, you'll see it completely differently. I will take maybe 10 more minutes on this subject, 
Then I'll give you guys a two minute break so where you can you know, make friends and enemies. And then I'll start talking again because I want your attention span to be fresh for the next part. But I will take these 10 minutes to tell you one more thing. I talked about two families. Starting where? Ismail and Ishaq. Which kept getting prophets? Ishaq's side. Until? Isa. Then they tried, then, you know, they made fun of prophets before. They even killed prophets before. But this was really bad. I mean, this one, they even went after him when he was a baby. At least leave a baby alone. They even went after his mom. This was beyond offensive. And so when they tried to kill him, not only did Allah rescue Isa alayhi salam, not only did he rescue Jesus, he also decided that no more for you. That's it. I gave you prophet every generation, yes or no? But no more. Six centuries went by, no prophets. Almost 600 years, no prophets. And their books actually told them that there is one final one coming. And they were waiting in anticipation. As a matter of fact, some Jewish tribes moved to Medina because their books told them that he's going to come to Medina. That he's going to migrate into the city. There were, some, there were companions of the Prophet uh, who were actually from Jewish lineage. And when he moved to Medina, they showed him letters of their ancestors that they had written to the Prophet, we came here in wait of you, but we didn't see you, so hopefully our children will. <laughs> He received those letters when he came to Medina. So the people were waiting for a prophet to come to which city? Medina. Like he will migrate here and we'll be, we'll be able to greet him. This was mentioned in their books. That's why, you know, when Allah says, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ They know him like they know their own kids. It was known. The problem was when the prophet finally came, according to them, the gift of messengership came to the wrong address. It was supposed to be on this side and all of a sudden, that side. What, what is this? We can't accept that. As a matter of fact, that entire narrative was created to demonize the children of Ismail. In later Jewish literature and now evangelical Christian literature, the children of Ishmael are cursed. They are evil. And their religion is evil. And that's why the religion of Islam is evil. Because this is a cursed lineage. And they created this mythology. So they couldn't accept that the, the gift of prophethood that they had for so long could be taken away, right? But it was taken away. Now, here's where things get really interesting. This, this was part of this last 10 minutes. The Prophet ﷺ, before Ramadan came, he actually used to fast. Before Ramadan. You know which days he used to fast? The same days as the Jews of Medina. Whatever they were, they were given in their book, he used to fast on the same days. The Prophet ﷺ used to pray before the change of the Kaaba, he still used to pray. In what direction? To Jerusalem. To illustrate that the religion that has come is not a different religion, this is still the religion of Ibrahim. And even though Ismail and Ishaq are two different lineages, lineage does not determine truth. Truth is truth. Those were prophets too. Just because you hate the Arab side, the Arabs don't hate the Israeli side. We're actually one religion, it's one source, it came from God. There's no way we're going to deny it out of spite. So unless God tells us otherwise, we're going to pray in the same direction and fast on the same days, because that was all revelation too. Our Prophet's job, alayhi salatu wasalam, is to confirm what came before him, to live by what came before him. So we used to follow the same qibla, pray in the same direction, and fast on the same days. Now, all of a sudden Allah decides, that they have, they have been given enough chances, now they don't deserve that we should consider ourselves one giant family. You guys need to be separated from them and you need to be, develop your own identity. The Muslims are now being told, you need to develop your own identity. You need to become your own nation. You now need to represent the pure legacy of Abraham without any corruption. So, here's step one. Because you're a new nation, you should get a new capital. And the capital should be the one built by the founding father. Founding father who? So the Qibla changes in, in, in Surah Al-Baqarah. First Allah talks about the Israelites and how they were disqualified. And then He says, Ibrahim alayhi salam built the Kaaba. And then He tells the Muslims, pray this way now. New, new capital for you. Now, a, a new nation has a new capital, but a new nation also has a new constitution. Yes? What's the constitution? Quran. And if a new constitution is celebrated, that that day that the constitution is implemented or celebrated, that day should be their Independence Day. Yes? And that day is celebrated every year by nations, isn't it? 
when a constitution is inaugurated? Well, inna anzalnahu fi. Forget Independence Day, we got Independence Month. That day was so powerful that it wasn't enough to celebrate one day, Allah made it 30 days of celebration. 30 days of celebration. It's an incredible thing. As a matter of fact, Ramadan is not just the celebration of the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ramadan is the celebration of the fact that we became a, a separate nation. A, a distinct nation before God. That's what we became with our own constitution. That's what we're celebrating, our unique identity as Muslims, as the restorers of the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's the beauty of this, this thing. SubhanAllah. You know, the day on which our direction in prayer changed, it was already known that the mission of the Prophet is going to be cleaning up the Kaaba. It's going to have to happen. Because that's the, that's the house built by the Father. It needs to be cleaned. So when is, the, when is the ayah? Today I have completed your religion. When does the ayah come? When the Kaaba is, when the idols are destroyed. When that legacy is restored. Everything comes back and that mission is completely fulfilled. SubhanAllah. This is, the, in a nutshell, what I wanted to give you about the historical perspective on the value and the power of Ramadan. One thing from the ayah of Ramadan, and I'm done. One thing, and that is Hudal Linnas. Shahru Ramadan, alladhi unzila fihi al Quran, Hudal Linnas. What does Hudal Linnas mean? Ramadan, Ramadan is the month in which the Quran came down. Hudal Linnas means as guidance for humanity. Just a couple of things about that. Before the Qur'an, what was the previous constitution that was revealed? Before Qur'an, what was the constitution? Injil. Yeah, Injil was actually a, a furthering of the original Torah. 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 Injil didn't have law. Torah had law. Now, the Torah was for all humanity? No. And that final messenger who had to come, he was supposed to be for the Arabs? Was he supposed to be for the family of Ibrahim? Was he supposed to be for all humanity? So the book that he was given had to be guidance for Hudal Linnas. It's guidance for all people. Allah specifically mentions this as guidance for all people. And he particularly highlights that in the month of Ramadan. I would argue because the people's, Allah, Allah softens people's hearts all over the world. In the month of Ramadan, Muslim and non. We have an opportunity in the month of Ramadan to share something about the guidance for humanity that we don't have any other time in the year. It's not just that Muslims, their hearts are softened. Allah didn't just say, Hudal lil Muslimin and Muttaqeen, that like He says in the beginning of Baqarah. He actually highlights here that the Quran that was given was given as a guidance for all of humanity. So if you have co workers, friends, if you have business partners, if you have family that's non Muslim, the time to maybe talk a little bit even about the Quran is what? It's Ramadan. Something will open up. You don't know. I'll tell you one crazy story about guidance for humanity. It's actually a true story. Pretty wild. One of my friends is a professor at a university in, uh, in the United States, in North Carolina, and he loves talking about the Qur'an. He just loves it. And his co-worker, who's Christian, every time he talks about the Qur'an, even if he says one word from the Qur'an, his co-worker starts getting an allergic reaction. His eyes turn puffy, he starts sneezing, he starts coughing, like... <coughs> every time. One time they're traveling together in the month of Ramadan. And my friend has a theory, maybe it's shayateen, I don't know. Somebody messes with him whenever I talk about the Qur'an, it's been going on for 10 years. But now we're traveling in Ramadan. And in Ramadan, what happens to the devils? The shayateen. They're chained. This is my chance. So he starts talking about the Qur'an. And there's no other, he's waiting for the sneezing to begin. He's got the napkins ready too. There's no sneezing. And we have a nice conversation for a couple of hours. And they've been talking about Islam since. And he told me last time we spoke, he said, hey, maybe a couple of months away from just becoming a Muslim. He's starting to pray with us too and stuff. SubhanAllah. Hudal nas. Don't underestimate it. Inshallah ta'ala. I pray that this is a, a wonderful Ramadan for all of you. And I pray, I made you repeat silly things after me. Because I hope that, inshallah, when you go back home, you can share some of this stuff with your family. You know, to, because this is what we have to do. We have to re restore our appreciation of our father Ibrahim alayhi salam and how everything is tied together in this beautiful religion. So I'm going to give you guys a two minute break and I'll talk to you about some really crazy stuff. Inshallah. So enjoy your two minutes. If, if you're still talking after two minutes, I don't care. I'll keep talking. There's not going to be a formal introduction. Please, please settle down, calm down, listen. Oh, none of that. Two minutes, 120 seconds.
حياكم الله شكرا لكم